Goedenavond. Goedenavond. Good evening. Welcome here. On behalf of the International Architecture Biennale Rotterdam, Keile Collective and Group A, I welcome you at this, if I recall correctly, seventh edition of Carbon Stories, Willem? He lost count, okay. Seven-ish uh, edition of Carbon Stories. Each edition has a different perspective on how architects, builders, constructors, everyone involved in creating the built environment can not only reduce CO2 emissions, but ideally become climate positive. Uh, this edition is about high-rise, as you all know. Uh, the question we will try to answer or address tonight is whether there is such a thing as carbon-neutral high-rise, uh, up to what height that might be or what conditions might be applicable then, uh, whether high-rise is desirable at all in times of fighting climate change, and what this means for the densification strategy uh, uh, for a city like Rotterdam. Uh, my name is Geert Maars, I'm your host. We will have four perspectives tonight, four talks. Julian van Sticht, Matthijs van Ruiven, Michiel Rapors and Thomas Musson, followed by conversation and debate with you all. Um, but as I always do during the beginning of Carmen Stories, I would like to check who we have in the audience. Who is an architect? Let me show some hands. Who is a constructor? Researcher? Policy maker? Something else? Urbanist, <laughs> student, how many students in the audience? Welcome, great that you are here. Something else that I haven't mentioned? Uh, you're in doubt about what you are? Yeah. <laughs> Professional identity crisis? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Consultant, okay. Um, any fans of high rise? Some hands? Who despises high rise and our fascination with it? Who has ever been involved in the creation of a high-rise project in one, some way in, or another? Who of the people that is... Uh, no, keep, uh, keep your hands up. Uh, who regrets it and would not do it again? Somehow, Julian van Sticht is the first uh, speaker tonight. So he will explain where his regrets lie. Um, who thinks high-rise doesn't have a place in a climate-proof city? Fascinating, only two hands. Um, we will discuss all these questions, discuss them with uh, our panel, with our speakers. They will uh, enter the stage for about uh, 15 minutes, share their ideas with you, their practices, and afterwards we will have a conversation with all of you. But before we do that, it's always a tradition to open up the night with the, the, the evil genius behind all of this. Please welcome, uh, on behalf of Group A and Carbon Lab, Willem van Genuchten. Thanks. It's also a tradition, this always goes wrong. Yeah, um, for me the, the nice task to welcome you all and to give a short introduction, a very superficial one, and then the guests go into much more detail. Um, for me, this edition has a bit of a personal note because high rise is the reason I became an architect. I was influenced very young. My mom had a Woody Allen period or Woody, Woody Allen stage in her life and we watched the movie Manhattan I was way too young, I didn't really get the story, but it was completely irrelevant. I fell in love with high-rise. To think a city is possible, which is consisting of towers, density, I wanted to live there, I wanted to be in such a place, I wanted to experience it, and I wanted to be involved in making this possible. This is what dreams are made of. High-rise is super powerful, it has identity, it provides with image, um, it combines ambition with capitalism. So as a kid, my dream continued. I made drawings, I envisioned cities. This is a drawing of when I was, I think, 12. Higher, 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 more, 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 dense, 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 always more. Then I lived the dream in reality. I moved to Chicago. I lived very close to the Hancock building. I saw it from my shower window every morning. It was a very nice way to wake up, start the day. And then I lived the dream in making architecture, making high-rise. Um, some in the room here today have also worked on these, uh, on these projects. On the left you see Capital City, which is part of the exhibition that we opened earlier today in Moscow, then the highest building in Europe. On the right, a tower in Kantimansisk, a city probably most of you never heard of in Siberia, a hotel. The one on the left is actually built, the one on the right is not. And in Rotterdam, working on 
a plan for high rise for Rijnhaven, a site you all know probably. And here the effort was to make it into a sustainable solution for the city. That's where the shift took place. And that's what we do with Carbon Lab. We look for an alibi for building, an alibi to in times of climate emergency still construct new projects. We research this question by making calculations, very boring, but then the question is what do you do with the calculations? What can you as a designer, as an engineer, as a policymaker achieve with this? Uh, we made calculations showing high rise is a problem. If you look at it only from the point of material, uh, sorry, uh, embodied carbon by the materials because it's very material intensive to make such a building possible. If you go to bio-based, these are the numbers of preliminary calculations. You see high rise climate neutral, probably not. Paris proof, perhaps. You have to still turn some buttons. The city of Paris has last summer decided to abolish high rise completely. They say it's no longer responsible to go over 12 levels. It's a very strict way of approaching this question. Maybe it's a bit simplistic. It's not really incentivizing innovation. You can also say whoever would demolish such a building, the Empire State Building or the Seagram Building, once it's built, you never take it down. Maybe there's an alibi for disembodied carbon to be emitted. Others say the density is a solution instead of a problem in terms of carbon. If we densify Rotterdam a lot, we have completely different lifestyles, different ways of mobility. Our colleagues from this building, City First, are doing research, comparing lifestyles uh, living in high density in the carbon footprint of a family or of, of an in inhabitant compared to living remote, living maybe in a very low density part of the city. It could be that this outdoes the embodied carbon of the tower. So that's the question. Is, there, uh, is it simple, yes or no, or is there a lot to say about this? We have uh, scheduled approximately one and a half hour to find out. Uh, when it's uh, uh, 9, uh, 9 15, uh, 9.30, we will uh, go to the bar and continue the conversation over there. Four perspectives, then open up the, uh, the room for all of you. And the first perspective is from somebody who published Hooghout Haalbaar, a study on Paris proof tendering, and advice for the four biggest cities in the Netherlands with regard to high rise. And with his office, he is the developer of the carbon cost tracker, an all in one tool to calculate and reduce the climate impact of a building building. Please welcome architect and founding partner at LEFS, Jurian van Sticht. Good evening. Well, something like that, yeah. Well, we did an investigation, but I think the first thing, of course, is making less is always the best. Eh? So everything less is better. Um, and I think this is the great problem we all know we have to solve, and this is also very well known, I suppose, for everybody. But actually, this is also the question. Eh? The, the first part of building, combined with the energy we use during the use of the building, is a factor seven, uh, the difference. So this is what we do have to do the next five, six, seven years, or maybe even two years. Um, and this is uh, the LCA. I'm not never sure if everybody knows it, but they always show it's A1 to A5 is in the Netherlands the goal. And uh, this is already coming. Eh? In April, there was a decision made already that all our big clients have to do by these rules. So they always come asking us, how are we going to get there? Can we make it high, can we make it low? So a year ago, we started a study with the G4, that is Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Den Haag, uh, um, um, and Utrecht, yes, I'm sorry, and Utrecht, and we just said, said okay, we make a tower, 30 meters, 70 meters, 25, 25 meters, and let's have an investigation. How much of these buildings can we build? How much resources do we have? Do we have enough sustainable materials from the, from the farmers? So how much do they have to produce the next few years? How many wood is available? So Wageningen, the university has made this study, so these reports you can all find on our website. Uh, the other issue is, of course, uh, uh, so uh, how much wood? The next issue is also the structure. What is a smart structure of building? So uh, Delft University made a lot of uh, models and what they found out is when we want to build high, don't build with boxes, but build with a small structure with less use of wood and use the steel in it. Um, and then you can see also, that's an important one, from let's say eight, ten stories, all the systems are almost the same. But when you are going higher, 
you see you're gonna use more and more wood and when you build in CLT, don't do it because you use too much wood and that's not sustainable because we don't have all these trees available. Transport is going to be important, also the transport in the cities. Uh, in Amsterdam, for example, in a few years, there are no cars allowed, no trucks allowed anymore. They have to be on electricity. Can you con see concrete transported by electric cars? I don't think so. So we have to make a solution for that. So there's a parametric tool made by Delft, uh, uh, Havia, and you can see it also. You can see the measurements. What's the impact of wha what we have to build different? Also, uh, yeah, the dust we have in the city, can we build with electricity or should we build in the traditional way? When you build with light materials, you can build with electric machines, with electric high-rise machines, high-rise electric. It's going to be the question in the city. But the most important thing, we are missing data. Data, data about the materials, data about, um, about what the costs are, the data of how much is available. So one of the issues is we made a lot of, uh, well, with Carbon Lab, all kind of people are busy with this data because we are missing it from the NMD. Um, and then, of course, we need a language. We need a language that we can understand each other, that we're talking about the same thing. So the new normal has been developed last year, and it has now been developed on building. This year it will also be on infrastructure, and it will also be developed on, uh, let's say, how to do a complete uh, area. So we have to not to measure only buildings, but what is the impact of an area? It was already mentioned, I think, uh, by Willem. And this new uh, performance, you can also see all the way we have to talk, this way we have to have this language about the materials, the way it's in kilograms, it is in square meters, it's very important so that we can understand each other. So we have this circus, well I saw the circus there, well this was also the circus. Do we need this and how do we work? Well this is our office behind me, this is how the plants that are under construction for the last 10 years. We have all these building envelopes and they were almost like this, always high, fat, where you can see it. So we are not doing it better than anyone else. But can we continue like this? Well, we see the new plants coming, The Hague, Rotterdam, Amsterdam. All these plants are now on the table. Are we can, can we re realize them? How many concrete is going down and how many is going up? Somebody else is going to talk about that. So can we build these carbon neutral buildings? That is actually the question. So what is the future for us? So that was one of the reasons that we started with this tool, because we see all these plants coming. And these tools, yeah, we can use it when we have the building ready with all the details, but we need it now because the plants are on the table. So what we try to do is to make a parametric tool um, when you don't have a building, you make just a the measurements of the building and you try to, uh, let's say, give without this tooling, you give the possibilities that there are. You don't want all the possibilities, but the possibilities within regulations, the possibilities that you make a nice house, a nice living for people. It's about people who want to live in these buildings. So it's not just about stacking people in the building, but um, quality. And of course, we need new materials and new ways of building with it. Um, and so this parametric tool, you can see is laid in the steward brand layers. So we can have the construction, the foundation, the insulation and the way it's structured. Well, this is the carbon cost tracker, how it is built up. You can see we have on one side the, the issues of a building and on the other side the, the, the measurements of CO2 stored, the MPG, the MKE, all that kind of information and yes also the building cost. And we combine all this data into information. We start to, to find out what is the information. So it's not the right, it's 80, 90 percent, but we are comparing solutions. Solutions, for example, in a test case we're doing for the city of Amsterdam already. This is a plan we made, uh, uh, let's say, we no call it a digital twin. So we build it with our carbon cost track and say, okay, city of Amsterdam, you want to do this carbon cost? You want to do it in price, social housing 40%, and you also want the CO2 reduction? Is it possible when you have these measurements that you give? So we made different possibilities within this same program. So what you can do, you can compare. So you can compare when you change the construction or you change the material or you do it hybrid, hybrid or whatever you want to change, you can change it step by step. And then you can see the impact you have. But when we calculate this, the MPG, you can see the results. 
when you do it, uh, let's say, normal, traditional, completely bio-based, well, we're getting better. And if you, like uh, Willem or other people do, you subtract the carbon you store, then it's uh, Paris proof positive. It's not the way I think we should approach it, but you can do it like that. So I don't believe it's possible, but if you subtract it, subtract it, it's possible. But anyway, this is what the city of Amsterdam wants. This is the way they want to approach it. Can people, it's 400, well it's almost the same, eh? we cannot build. But what are we going to do then? If we cannot build, how should we approach it? And also, how is the building, eh, how much brick is in it? What is the material? You can see it precisely. So we made some advices in the report, which is downloadable. So higher is not better. We need data, data, data. And uh, look at the area. So looking at the area, we did before, eh, focus on the scale. We did it before. Last year, I showed you Amsterdam, uh, or the Netherlands, I'm sorry, with all the new dwellings we have to build. Is this possible? Eh, because we need this minister who has this carbon budget also. He's not going only with money, but he also today has this carbon budget. Within this budget, can you build it? Well, as you see behind me, this is the amount he wants to build, and this is the reality he can build. We cannot build it. And when we do it better, hybrid, we cannot build it. And if we do it much better, we still cannot build it. With 1.5 degrees, and we can go to 1.7, we can build a little bit more. But altogether, we have to look at the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is of course the area. We also busy with the city of Amsterdam looking at the urban space. What is the infrastructure underneath? What are the streets? How much asphalt? How much, how much surface? How much can we use there? What's the CO2 of that areas? And then we start comparing. We're doing this at the moment for Amsterdam, three locations. And we're starting to compare them. This is the first test. And you can see, and we do it on the level of the living, of an uh, apartment. Not on, on, not on square meters, but on the, an apartment. Because in the city you build smaller apartments, outside you build bigger apartments or bigger houses, but you lose less ground. So it's about 35 tons an apartment. And then, uh, yeah, well the details, we have to go further in detailing. But where should we build? I mean, this looks much better, or not? 2.7 less possible if we do it like this. Small houses everywhere in the Netherlands. So how bad is high rise and how good is the other one? I'm not, so I'm not sure yet. So this is what we have to investigate in my mind. So if we build outside, well, we can build almost nothing in this country. So minister, watch your steps. Quick, 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 building, building, building. Maybe think twice. So that's my story. Thank you. Question for you, um, and we had an argument whether you, whether Jurian uh, was able to fit 70 slides into 13 minutes, and he succeeded. So, um, and this is the extreme weather we uh, we uh, we are receiving more and more, even here. Um, Jurian, uh, the question is: Is there such a thing as carbon neutral high rise? Your answer is no. No. Right? No, um, it, it, I, I want to pr be pro precise because everybody's talking about Paris proof. I think the issue is that all industries should do better. So concrete, steel, etc. And within 20, 20 years, 15 years, when we have other types of energy, like for example, uh, uh, water, water power, uh, or other ways of getting electricity, even a, a brick layering, brick uh, factory can be CO2 positive. So it depends on the time, but today, the next five, six, seven years, it will not be possible. Okay. Any uh, questions for now to Jurian? Then uh, see you back in a minute. Thank you, uh, Jurian van Sticht. <laughs> and next in line is somebody who will say something about Rotterdam's identity.
the skyline has always been a big part of it. Um, but how dominant are high-rise buildings in its current and future densification strategy? Uh, how do skyscrapers fit in a city that also wants to be Paris-proof? We will hear the perspective of the head urban planner at the municipality of Rotterdam. Please welcome Matthijs van Ruijven. Yeah, good evening everyone. Um, I'll try 25 slides, I think, in 13 minutes. Um, yeah, I'll uh, take you through uh, Rotterdam. In the end, this is what we want, nice skyline, but also a uh, good public space that you can sit, relax, and hopefully some sunshine. Um, but this is, well, this is now, uh, you could say, uh, all, this, uh, all this weather we have. Um, well, this is the effect of climate uh, change, you could say, that we can also experience here in Rotterdam. Uh, and luckily we have uh, a lot of paving here, so you can capture all that water and you can jump in the pool. Um, no, you have to do something. So you need less paving for, well, this problem and also what you uh, experienced just, uh, just now. So that is one of the, the aspects that we have to deal with as a city and working on as a city. And it relates to building, of course, and also to high-rise. Um, another thing is that the demography is changing in many cities, but also in Rotterdam. So, uh, well, more nationalities, that is one thing. Um, but 50% one-person households. So if you think... Uh, in cost of carbon, but also in cost in euros, if you live by yourself. And uh, I don't know, are there m how many one person households are there here today who lives by themselves? Well, not 50%. No. Um, we are lucky. Um, but 50%, and I think in Utrecht it's already 60%. So that is also something we have to keep in mind by. Well, developing the future of our city and de developing our buildings. Um, and we are growing. More nationalities coming in. It's mainly immigration. Um, seven and a half thousand last year, eight and a half the year before. So that's something also that you have to deal with. We have to build because we also think that if you have to sleep on the street, that's not an option. It is happening, but it's not an option. So you need those houses. And do you build new ones or will you densify in the existing housing stock? Um, well, that's something you can do. And as a city, we have a city vision and we say good growth. So we don't want to grow necessarily, but we are growing. So how are we going to do it in a good way? Well, one thing is by doing it together and doing it together is more and more, I agree, sharing data. That's an important factor. Uh, use the identity, well, what is Rotterdam today and tomorrow, uh, well, and incorporate all these perspectives. It has to be sustainable, of course, uh, to end compact. Um, so is high rise still an answer for uh, Rotterdam? I will take you through it, and in the end, I have a conclusion, and you can agree or disagree. We'll, uh, we'll see. Um, this is an image of... Uh, a nice triangle tower here in the city. Um, and this is the, uh, well, the fantastic view that you have for the experience from, uh, from this side. Um, severe weather conditions, but also the temperature, heat island effect. Um, well, then it's a good thing that you have high rise and all this turbulence and these big winds. In winter, it's, uh, it's not so nice, but in summer, perhaps it could be a good thing. I'm, I'm joking a little bit, of course, but designing with wind during these, well, very high temperatures in summer is something we have to look at because we see that during these heat waves, more, uh, especially elder people or people with uh, not so good health, they are dying. So there's a, an, an increase in people dying in our city. Is that okay or should we develop a city in another way and deal with that heat. That's something we have to think about. Um, then the role of high rise currently today in developing our city. I've got some numbers for you. Well, we want to build uh, approximately three and a half thousand new homes every year. Um, and if you look in the future, 20% of that production in the future consists of high rise. We have the offers of 
developers, architects who want to build high rise. So 20% of the overall, hey, we want uh, 700 of, of uh, building 40 to 50,000 homes, uh, close to uh, 2030, 2040. Um, so that's quite a lot, it's one fifth. Um, but you also see that an average of one tower is completely completed every one and a half years. That is just the numbers here in Rotterdam. So that's not so much. It takes a lot of time. Well, and I think most of you already know that uh, the Zalmhaven Toren took a lot of time to, to develop, to redesign, to redevelop, and then in the end you will start building it. Uh, currently, there are three towers being built that are above 70 meters, and one of them is uh, post, and I only show you the ground floor, the first few layers. In the end, in our high-rise policy, height is okay, but the ground floor is more important. Um, a lot of high-rise towers in development, but as I said, it takes a lot of time, so therefore we also push the pause button for new high-rise initiatives because they ask a lot from us, and in the current debate, uh, well, it's also, you can question, um, but we have a lot of plans for high-rise, so you don't have to worry if you're a high-rise fan, they're still uh, being developed, being designed, um, but we put, uh, we put the uh, push the, the pause button. And we can't build high-rise everywhere in our city, so it's not the answer, for the densification of Rotterdam. So here you see, in 2000, it was in the, well, around uh, Central Station, Kop van Zuid, uh, a little area. Then later on, it expanded in 2011. And currently, it's in uh, several uh, places in the city where there's good public transport. So Alexander with the train station and the metro, uh, Hart van Zuid, uh, Zuidplein, Feyenoord City, and the bigger inner city on both sides of the river. That's where we can build high rise. That's our policy. So in all the other areas, if we want to densify, high rise is not the option there. And also, and after, uh, you, you already mentioned it, um, we're not living in New York with a rocky surface. No, it's clay, it's peat, and so on. So we have to look more carefully at what's underneath. A tower of 150 meters in some places in Rotterdam mean foundation poles of 85 meters, which is quite ridiculous. And it can be, well, it can be a wooden tower, but then you need the, the concrete foundation. So that is uh, quite strange. Also for the energy supply, uh, the VKO, you also have to dig deep and it's wider than the, the plot of the tower. Uh, so what do you do there? So we have to look at these uh, factors. Also, if you put in a lot of foundation poles, the soil is moving away and uh, it hits a metro tunnel. Well, that's a big problem. So that is things we have to look at and that is, uh, well, you could say my daily work that also these problems uh, are on my desk and uh, I'm not gonna solve them, but we are discussing it. What to do we do? So the underground is really important in Rotterdam and is limiting high rise. Um, and like I said, it's not only high rise in Rotterdam, it's a lot more typologies that we built by densifying uh, our city. There's many examples. I thought you would have the example uh, Rozenknoop uh, at uh, Parkstad, uh, Laan op Zuid. Um, this is an example, North Single, the Oude Noorden, or Achnise Buurt. Um, nice example of having a, a seven, eight story high building, more density in your city. So we have different typologies as well. Um, developing high rise also demands a lot from us as a municipality. Yeah, it takes a lot of time to develop it together and it takes a lot of money. Currently, half our annual city budget is going to social, um, yeah, uh, social factors, you could say. So dealing with unemployment, people that are in debt that you have to help, uh, dealing with bad health, and so on. That's half the annual city budget. So investing, and that's happening in the existing neighborhood, so a lot of our investments are going towards the existing neighborhoods. Well, can you put in high-rise in those existing neighborhoods? 
well, probably they are not in the high-rise zone. And if they would be, would you build a tower opposite this building? Now we have lots of issues here with the existing housing stock, with the public space that is sinking. Now you need stairs to enter your house, and so on, and so on. So high rise, developing high-rise in the city is also well, quite a financial thing, also for the municipality, and a lot of our budget is going in other directions. And if you look at developing in a, well, on, on the longer term in history, history this is a nice graph. Um, in the end, we are not making a lot of money with developing our city. We spend money and we need a lot of funding from the national government. And here you see how that funding of the national government is taking place. And now, well, it's numbers from 21, it's not so much. And it's almost like a tombola. Uh, you can apply for some subsidy for your project. It's not that you get a lot of money as a city to develop and make the choices. No, it's not like that. So if, and, and, and one thing we know is that if you want to develop more in a, in a more sustainable way, and it's experimenting, it costs money. And this is the reality in funding from the national government. So also there, quite difficult how to build a lot of high-rise or use high-rise as the strategy in Rotterdam. Well, and then if you look at uh, carbon emissions, well, this is a nice graph. Um, it says that in the end we need to get to that little red box and well, we're more or less getting there, but this is without the port and it's only scope one and two. Well, that's nothing. And it's only the, set the city. So for our sewer system and uh, public transport and so on. Uh, so we have a lot of statistics. We can make, we produce nice graphs, but is, is it the overall carbon emission? I don't know. This isn't. And what we also know is that the structure, the main construction, that is where you can gain a lot of carbon emission. So how uh, are you going to deal with that? Well, and then it's carbon, carbon, carbon. We have to deal with a lot more, and you have to deal with a lot more. EU taxonomy is something we have to deal with, and it's about, well, also looking at wildlife, biodiversity, circular economy, and so on. So that is that are those regulations that are coming from the EU. I don't know if the elections in the beginning of June will mean something for this policy. I don't know, but we'll have to see. But this is also something we as a city have to deal with. And perhaps this is even more important. We want more green, but biodiversity, if that whole system collapse or collapses, then we have a big problem uh, in Rotterdam, but also in the Netherlands, in the whole world. So it is also something we have to deal with. Deal with. So no more high rise in Rotterdam. One thing we also know is that this is also coming. No, let, uh, no net land take. So we can't build in the open fields anymore. And if Rotterdam is growing and growing and growing, and we're growing faster than we think, that's what we see, that's what the numbers tell us, um, then we have to densify and densify our city. Because no net land take. And it's, of course, also the bigger picture. We're doing a lot of research at the moment. I think we're doing the same research as you are doing. Uh, so we have to well, come together again. Um, this is a nice, uh, this is something we are re uh, doing research about too. This is a research uh, from uh, Belgium looking at um, the infrastructure you need for the topologies that you have. And there you see if you build in a really dense way, you only need nine meters of infrastructure for the building. And then, and you showed it as well, if it's not, if it's, if, if it's widespread or it's uh, low density, then you need 80, uh, 68, uh, no, 86 uh, meters of infrastructure. Well, infrastructure is carbon emission because it's asphalt or the bricks, or but it's also the sewer system that's all concrete and there's a lot more. All these cables taking place going in. So this is something we are investigating, and one thing is building it, but the other thing is maintenance. 
maintenance, the whole lifespan of a building or an infrastructure becomes more and more important due to EU regulations. So what do they use as carbon? And if you uh, renovate the whole system, then you have emission again. So this becomes more and more uh, important. And if you look at maintenance, we never look at maintenance in this way. So if uh, our minister says, we're going to build in the outskirts, I don't know why, but every municipality should, should object because of maintenance. So we're also calculating now what are the maintenance costs per house in different parts of Rotterdam. And we also now see that it's much lower in the inner city, in the dense areas, than on the outskirts of Rotterdam. Carbon-based urbanism is also a research that we are starting. Well, I think we have to team up. Um, but looking at the bigger picture, also looking at the daily, uh, daily life of people. Are you biking? Are you, well, whatever you do. Uh, what, what will happen there? So this is a research that we do. Another research is that we're making al analysis and calculations of projects in Rotterdam. So we invite uh, developers, investors, architects to bring in their projects and share the information. And one project, I'm not going to say which project it is, but it's not high rise. We made the calculations and it's uh, 242 kilograms above Paris proof. Biodiversity, fantastic, and then so on. Uh, but these are the numbers. And the MPG, 0.56. I'm not the expert, but that's, I think, it is okay. Um, so we all were quite puzzled. How is it possible that it's more than uh, double the Paris proof? So that is something we are going to talk with, with the builder, with the developer, with the architects, with all the advisors about. Um, yeah, we're going to make also calculation strategies overall for all our new development. How can that be Paris proof? So a lot of research there. Uh, if you look at new development, this is a, a nice one. Dura Vermeer, we all know uh, this construction company, says uh, this is completely in line with EU taxonomy. So that's possible. It's, it's, it's just above 70 meters. And I think it could be a really sustainable building. The, the poor thing is that <laughs> they had to demolish a, a building, which was just about the same height, but that is also what is well happening in city development. But Apparently, we can build and develop buildings quite high within the EU taxonomy. So that is a good thing. And that is also a way we look at uh, Rijnhaven, which is a big development. We have a fantastic plan, three blocks, big park. That's what we do. Um, and we look at innovations in high rise for Rotterdam, but we all we want to apply them in Rijnhaven. So that is about energy. How can you do that? So we have a nice energy system for the whole area. Looking at wind, materials, water, and so on. And also at the logistics. And also looking at the underground. So that is what we do and what we want to uh, put in that development. And in the end, when we tender the lo several locations, we also ask for by the, the ones that well, want to win that uh, development. Also looking at innovations in design, in materials, and so on. Perhaps in the facades. The left is with solar panels and with uh, less direct sun uh, than on the right. And also in my office building, the Rotterdam, on the south facade, gets quite warm on sunny days. So that is, And then you need a lot of installations. And I think installation costs are... 30, 40, 50 percent of the overall building cost. So we have to look at those things. And installation means kilometers of pipes and so on. And that is emission. So we have to, well, yeah, I'm going to finish up. Uh, we have to be, well, innovate a lot if we want to have Paris proof high rise. But I think we were also quite slappy over many years. We could just build and develop use the concrete, the same concrete uh, as in the 40s. Uh, so, but this is what we need, and this is what we want in, uh, in, in, in Rijnhaven. So will high-rise have a future in Rotterdam? 
I think it can have a future in Rotterdam, but it has to give back to society. And it can be in affordable housing, it can be in, well, in the, uh, the, all the, the demography, climate, biodiversity, uh, and so on. So I'm optimistic, but only if it gives back to society. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so uh, you will not ban high rise. I'm a little puzzled after your presentation. I was like, oh, the next slide, he's going to answer the question. No, he's rather I'm going to ban no, high rise no, or no. not. We're not going to do this because this and this and this. But yeah, and can you? You you are going to accept as a municipality buildings that are 80, 120, 250 meters tall. That's not a ne per se not an not an issue based on the 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 the, the, the research you have w well seen until now. The research is quite clear, and the EU taxonomy is also quite clear. I think if you look at it and then like in a from an urbanist perspective, or mm -hmm. like an in a bigger area, you can add high rise, but you have to do something uh, else as well. Meaning? With the Rijnhaven development, we're gonna build in high rise, we think that's good, we already have all the infrastructure, so we don't need the infrastructure. We're also gonna be build or develop a big park, um, high density, thinking that people will uh, walk a lot. Uh, and then I think you, well, I don't know if in it, it will be uh, a challenge, but I think in the end you can have not the positive numbers, but better numbers than if you're just going to develop a high rise in a certain spot. Okay. So it, 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 it relates to other developments that you are doing in a okay. city. And otherwise, it's over. Okay. okay. We'll get back to it uh, in the discussion later on. Thanks, Matthijs van Ruiten. Our next guest is uh, one the designer of one of the latest iconic additions to the Rotterdam skyline, the Coal Tower. Uh, knowing what he knows now, would he do it again? Would he uh, develop this tower again? Get involved in 50 stories, 150 meters high project? And if he would, what would it take to do this in a carbon neutral way? Please welcome architect and founding partner of V8 Architects, Michiel Raporst. Is everybody still doing okay? I feel a little bit intimidated after seeing all these figures and graphs and numbers and um, it's too much, almost. Uh, so uh, thank you also Willem from Carbolab for inviting me because I think this is one of these evenings where I learn more than uh, that I'm going to tell actually because I feel like an architect, you also had an office, it's almost like I feel like going back to school learning so much and making my profession as architect so relevant. Um, well, I, th I think I should, yeah. Um, so this is me, uh, this is our tower. Uh, now we, I think we are redefining our profession as architects and really trying to give answers to these uh, very measurable uh, problems. Um, uh, Willem was showing Paris, so what? What is the problem high rise is solving? Of course, there's this density issue. And I think uh, Matthijs explained why in Rotterdam, eh, due to the post-war reconstruction, there's only retail in the center of area. We needed more houses. So therefore, also in the urban tissue of Rotterdam, high rise was a solution. Uh, but if you really would do it all over again, we know that Paris, of course, has the highest density. Eh, so building mid-rise, eight stories high, making good blocks, sizes of blocks and streets, that's where you can host the most of uh, most of people. So apparently there are more reasons to do high rise, uh, and uh, also you have to find the you could say the local reasons to do high rise. If you see all the models there, um, you could say high rise is a, a very generic global model, and most of the time it's um, it's a building system. It's engineering. And there's a, there's a facade cladding. Uh, it looks fancy, it looks shiny, but how do you make a tower local? That's the question we asked ourselves at the office when we uh, got the assignment for uh, the cool tower. Um, let's make a tower which is truly related to Rotterdam. So at the end, the tower is also sustainable in a way that hopefully it will be the cathedral of the future. Uh, it will define 
the skyline of Rotterdam. It's so much structure you make, so it needs to stand for a very long time. And it needs to tell a, st uh, a story of Rotterdam. People should be able to relate to it. Then you make a very valuable building. So not a product of the building industry and make it purely only on efficiency, but also making it very um, meaningful. Uh, the sketch you show uh, that I show here is uh, something we made on a sunny Sunday afternoon. Rudolf and me, were my partner, were walking around the area, and suddenly we had this idea. And um, it came from intuition, you could say, but it came also from thinking about high-rise and also from naivety, optimism, because we in our studio never designed a building higher than six floors. So this was fairly a new adventure uh, to us. Um, but I think that's cool. Because as an architect, you need to be able to be very open, ask questions to people who know much more about high-rise than we as architects. And that's especially the structure engineer. So how do you get this thing up? Uh, how do you make sure that it's buildable in time and in, in cost? Uh, so I think this, this uh, strong collaboration with the structure engineer, for awesome in, in this sense, made this uh, project. And I think the architecture of the cool tower is literally the expression of the structure of the of the cool tower. Um, there are multiple themes in this uh, tower, which I will address uh, shortly. Uh, I think uh, to to relate to uh, Matthijs' story, the the very essential thing, of course, is that you see a tower, but you see also what we call the landing block or Rotterdam Solar in, uh, in in good English. That's of course the urban tissue of of the city. And in Rotterdam, we have the rule that if you high rise this block is always twice the footprint of your tower. So you enable that you have more floor space to in include all the necessities you have, like technique, but also allow the dentist or the little coffee bar or whatever in your print where you can activate uh, the street. So that uh, was also applicable to the cool tower. And actually that also has defined the size of the cool tower. Because the cool tower is built in the, in the middle of, uh, of Rotterdam in the Baanquartier where it replaces those four buildings. Um, this is not monumental, but it was seen as typical for Rotterdam. Uh, and we asked ourselves the question, okay, if we land the tower to replace this, how can we make sure that if you walk on that street, you still feel that you walk on a street with smaller houses, you could say. Not a, not a big tower, but some smaller houses. So play with, uh, play with scale, but maybe also play with what we call association. So this is post-war reconstruction architecture, which has a very clear definition on composition and elements used. And we thought it would be so nice to give a contemporary interpretation uh, to this. Uh, here you see how the, 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 the in situ, the, the, the plan. So this is tower. This is this landing block, and this is yeah, this is something I need to explain. Um, <laughs> this area, the banquety was always quite the marginal zone in Rotterdam. It used to be, now if you want to have a, che a cheap checkup on your car, you would go there. Now the all these garages and a little bit uh, uh, workshops that was hosted in this uh, in this part of uh, part of town. So therefore, you had two expedition streets. And when we got the assignment to design the tower, this was already granted for, that this was the landing block, this was the, the position of the tower with a little setback, but this was a parking garage. Um, really, a parking garage above street level. Uh, if you ask me, what would you do over again? We fired it two years to get this thing on the ground, or at least to make it, uh, let's say, uh, adaptive, so you could uh, turn it into housing. We never uh, won that, that fight. I would fight uh, three more years to get that done because th I think that's really a pity. If you talk about activating your city and uh, uh, giving potential for the future, then you should not build a parking garage above ground. Um, we could turn this disadvantage in a slight advantage that at least the top of it, the roof, is uh, a roof garden for the inhabitants of the tower. So you have like 1,500 square meter of garden for like children parties or uh, uh, neighborhood gatherings. So I think that's a really cool quality in the, in the city. Uh, so how do you make a, a tower really local, really contextual? We checked in chronological order the height development of uh, Rotterdam. It starts with uh, the Witte Huis, and then it ended at that time at uh, Boston, Seattle. I first was here. So you see all these different heights, but you can also see some kind of a similarity. Because if you 
put them all together, compress them together, then this is your height map. And you see a lot of these towers, they come up to around 70 meters. And that's very typical because 70 meters is where, of course, the, um, the fire safety uh, rules change. So up until 70 meters, it's, uh, it's, it's normal, you could say. Above 70 meters, you get a much more heavy uh, uh, rules uh, for, your, uh, for your fire safety. So they become much more uh, uh, expensive, those towers. So there's a typical Rotterdam height, you could say. So we thought, well, let's try to make a model where we don't do the classical tower stacking, like you have the plinth, the middle piece, and uh, the funny crown at the top. But maybe we could use this typical presence at, at in the sky of 70 meters to make actually the, the most heaviest point of the, of the tower. And coincidentally, this is also the point where you could say that there's a kind of a maximum in comfort if you would take, uh, the wind is going up, gets more uncomfortable all the way at the top. But the view is interesting at the top, but you have contact with the street at the bottom. So can we dramatize, you could say, this, um, this middle piece of the, of the tower? And that has resulted in, uh, in, this, uh, in this scheme, where all these themes come together. So if I start at the bottom, here you see how we, in a subtle way, uh, uh, translated these four existing uh, uh, buildings into the new landing uh, block of the tower. And in the middle, the tower uh, uh, fits in, you could say. And then in the, mid in the middle piece, there's this what we call middle crown. So that's the heavy, you could say the gravity point almost of the tower. And then gradually, you see it dematerializes to the top and also dematerial dematerializes to the, to the bottom. So that's a very, and I think the cool thing is that you can also see that from a distance. There's also, of course, with high rise, it has meaning from when you cross the river at Riemenhout Bridge, but also if you're close at five meters. So make no mistake, high rise is not only about the big distance, it should work on every, uh, every scale. And here you see how that works in reality. So this is this uh, middle piece. And this is Schiedamse Dijk with this existing architecture. And somehow with all these horizontals, it relates quite nicely also in coordination with what is, the, uh, what is there. Um, we asked ourselves the question, if you want to live in a, in a tower, why, why would you want to live in a tower? Of course, that's the view. But most of the towers, I think 99 out of 100 towers, have this facade with all these windows in it. That's because the facade is load-bearing, make sure the tower doesn't, uh, doesn't fall over. Because we never designed a building higher than six floors, we thought we can do that completely differently. So we challenged our structure engineer to come up with a different solution. Um, and we found one, uh, which is more typically used in Canada and, uh, and, and the States, which is called an outrigger structure. So we have this core in the building, and we have columns at the perimeter of a floor slab. But by doing so, we can make uh, panoramic uh, views. And we could also uh, optimize the, the orientation of balconies. So what you see here, this is the living area with a panoramic view. So there's, no, there's a column here behind, but all the rest is glass. And we position the balconies in the middle of the tower, so away from the corner, because you have the less... Uh, wind turbulence in the middle of the of the tower, and this is what uh, what what results. Uh, so you also see we made this parapet not too high, so it's like 40 centimeters. I hate this glass which goes all the way to the ground. I I'm af afraid of heights, by the way, so that's maybe maybe why. But it feels so comfortable if you have this little edge around your floor slab, and of course it's such a height that when you're sitting on your couch, lying on your couch, you still look over to uh, to Rotterdam. And then by positioning the balconies here in the middle, we have this free view uh, of, uh, of Rotterdam. And it really works, uh, works great. Um, here you see the, the structure. So this is this outrigger system. So a big core in the middle and these columns on the side. And that makes this uh, configuration of the facade uh, possible. And what we did, uh, because of course, when you do a tower, you have the ambition that it will stand for, uh, for 400 years. Um, but make it as flexible as possible. So what we did is, this is the, the, the core. There are no load-bearing walls in the perimeter. So potentially you can freely space all the walls between apartments, or you can combine apartments. Uh, so basically it's like an open plan, uh, where on all sides you have balconies, and in the middle you have a, a, a good functioning core. 
uh, and that resulted in this uh, in this problem. We also see that like the surface areas are uh, squeezed between the structural core and uh, the elevators and the and the stairs. So yes, it is a solid structure. Yes, it's made of concrete. Yes, it can stay for many many years, but it offers a very flexible uh, floor plan. And this is this uh, this middle piece we call the middle crown. Uh, normally we have six apartments per floor, and we thought it would be cool to do it slightly different here. So not make the crazy apartments all the way at the top, but also at this level because it's like uh, a cast in the sky. So we have four apartments on this floor, which each of them has 75 square meters of balcony. So a three meter deep balcony, 25 meters around, so 75 square meters of balcony. So imagine you know, your sliding doors, you make them open, it's almost like a porch uh, in at 70 meters high in the, in the middle of the city. And we do love details. Um, a high-rise building is also something you touch at, uh, at street level. So we made this uh, meticulously detailed entrance area and also natural stone with all kind of little edges and stuff. And that is really important. And we thought if we pay attention to the detail, let's also put that at, um, say make that a theme all the way up. And here you see the facade. And you see this, this gradual approach we had in the pos position of the, um, say of the material. So more massive balconies here, more glazed balconies at the, at the bottom. The red lines indicate what we call micro relief. So the same way as the Bayagorf has it. So there's this natural stone which has a relief which uh, attracts more dirt, you could say. So you see the aging of the facade will also happen with this facade. So there's a tiny relief in here, which is also present here. And it really shows. It really shows even at 50 meters distance when the sun is casting on the building, you see those little details. You also see the details were made here. So the facade is not only straight panel, but there's this little edge here which casts a shadow and also this uh, lintel. I, of I the love your frame. enthusiasm, Michiel, but yeah. you're out of time. I've gone around yeah. up, yeah. Anyway, there's a lot of detail in the building, so check it out. <laughs> but of course, there's also a lot of carbon. So now I come to the the next part, um, and also the problem, what we learned from uh, doing cold tower, because this is the building, and this is the substructure, the foundation. So basically, we make a building in the ground. We do that because we live in a swamp. So you can question whether it's smart in Rotterdam or in the south of the west of Holland to even make high rise, because it took us more than a year to make this building underneath uh, underneath grade. Um, and that's what we want to challenge. So um, a few things for the debate I would like to address. We learned that high rise is all about efficiency. Um, and we have to challenge efficiency. We have to also challenge, let's say, the flexibility. Because in the tower, all the installations are integrated in the structure. And we should separate them because a the structure can last for many hundred years. But we know installations are subsequent to, uh, to change. So we need to allow for that, uh, that space. We did some quick calculations on how much concrete do we have in, how does it compare to, uh, to single family uh, houses. Uh, we saw all the math from, uh, from Jurian. Um, but there's an easy catch, because there are different types of cement. The one uh, is uh, hardening fast, the other one is hardening slow. And of course, the all the contractors want to use the speedy uh, concrete, but that uh, puts out a lot on much more carbon as the slow hardening concrete. And the funny thing is, what if you build a tower, you know that it will last for four years. So if you're building the foundation, you could pretty much order your facade elements in time, but make sure of the more, more sustainable cement. And somehow that just doesn't happen. So all the taxonomy and all these rules will help us to uh, to get a cap on uh, on that one. And I also think if you talk about uh, um, a sustainable, should it be circular, should it be demountable, or are we able to make buildings which are really truly part of our city uh, where people can relate to and which have the potential to stay there for many hundred years and be flexible and adaptable in time. So that was my speedy finish off. Thank you, thank you, Michiel. Um, but to get back to the main question of tonight, uh, could you have done this in a carbon neutral way? No. Okay. Um, 
is that something we should take into account when thinking about creating buildings like this again in a city like Rotterdam? Uh, or is there are there enough reasons to legitimize what you were doing, being that it works for the identity of a city, it's it's there 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 are tons of reasons why you should want this as a city? Um no, I think the in, in, in itself, the tower is a good tower. Um, so yes, if, if, if you want to densify, then towers for Rotterdam are good. The, the, the thing what we should not do is making parking garage above street level. Okay. That's the, that's that's the one thing you We should really make buildings which create a city and offer potential for the future. Okay. And then it's worthwhile to invest in maybe not carbon neutral, but you solve your carbon neutrality on, on uh, let's say, larger scale. Yeah. The same as energy. You can't solve these transitions on a building process. How high would it have been if you wa wanted to have created this in a carbon neutral way? <sighs> would you have stopped at, at 50 meters, at 60, at 70, at the 70 meters? I, I would guess, I would guess 30, 35. Okay, okay, okay. See you in uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. Michiel Raaphorst. We also have an, uh, uh, another architect but an engineer in our midst. He will elaborate on a number of high hybrid high-rise projects worldwide. Uh, he's working for WSP, which is a very big uh, engineering office, uh, 80,000 people working worldwide. And here with us tonight, Thomas Musson. Give him a big hand. Okay, so yeah, I'm Thomas Musson, senior consultant at WSP. Really though, at heart, I'm a structure engineer on a sustainability journey. So for the first 10 years of my career, I would go around telling anyone that would listen, I designed that, I was very proud. But then something changed. I looked back at what I'd created and I designed, and I started to think, I designed that? Too much concrete, too much over design, not sustainable enough. And that sustainability journey has brought me here today to talk to you about hybrid high-rise. One thing I learned me into the Netherlands, though, is that you've got to check we're all speaking the same language. So before we dive into hybrid high-rise, I just want to check we all know what we're talking about. So what is high-rise? Well, it turns out there's no absolute definition of what a tall building is. The Council for Tall Buildings and uh, Urban Habitat give us three criteria which we can check to see if our building is high-rise. The first criteria is that it's distinctly taller than the norm. The second is slender enough to give the appearance of a tall building, so taller than it is wide. And the third is a building containing technologies which may be attributed as being a product of tall, so outrigger stability systems, lifts, um, to transport people great distances. All of that means high-rise can be anywhere between 15 metres to 300 metres. Anything above 300 metres is super tall, but depending where you are in the world, high-rise can mean a lot of different things. The other thing that high-rise does is it divides people. You either love it or you hate it. And a bit of context for people who don't know what Marmite is, Marmite is something the English spread on their sandwiches. And nothing has divided a nation more than Marmite. Not even Brexit or Boris Johnson. <laughs> and it's easy to see why the tall buildings divide people. One of these is a 435 meter tall tower with 46 apartments. The other is a 72 meter tall tower with 52 apartments. Both of them are engineering marvels, but one of them I think most people would agree is a little bit nonsensical. Whether you love them or you hate them, it doesn't really matter because they're here to stay. This is a chart that shows the number of high-rise completed each year, and as you see, it's growing. There's been a little blip there where COVID came along and pe the world stopped, but there's nothing to say it's not going to stop growing like this. And that leaves us with a problem. We're in the middle of a climate crisis, Many of you will have seen uh, the rain last week in Dubai. Those kinds of incidents are only going to become more common as the te global temperature rises. So we need to do something. We need to cut greenhouse gas emissions, and we need to do it quicker than we've ever done it before. And you've heard people today talk about carbon neutral, net zero. We need to talk about that. 
carbon neutral and net zero are used quite a lot. Net zero is Paris proof, basically. But they're very different. Carbon neutral is all about cutting carbon emissions and then the remaining are being offset through financial investments. There's no prescribed limit to how much you have to reduce carbon by with carbon neutral. You could do nothing, and if you could pay for it, you could offset all of your carbon emissions through investments. Net zero or Paris proof, that's about um, cutting greenhouse gas emissions, not just carbon, all of the emissions. And there's targets with that. We have to cut 90% of our emissions by 2050, with the other 10% being taken up by natural offsetting, so seas, forests. Net zero is backed by science. Carbon neutral is, well, a bit of a lottery, really. So is hybrid, hybrid high-rise carbon neutral? The answer I've said here is no, but I don't think any building can be carbon neutral because I think what we're trying to do is make buildings Paris-proof. That's the best way we're going to restrict global warming through the emis emissions that are coming from our buildings. So the real question is, can hybrid high-rise contribute to net zero? Let's find out. For a building to be net zero, it's got to have a few things going for it, and we've talked about this already tonight. It's not just about the carbon emissions or the greenhouse gas emissions. For a building to be net zero, you've got to build less, so use less stuff, reuse as much as possible. You've got to build light, so use lightweight material, reduce the weight of your material. You've got to build wise, so maximize off-site fabrication, use um, repetitive floor layouts. You've got to build low carbon, so avoid high carbon materials, optimize the use of things like timber. You've got to build for the future, so design for disassembly uh, and adaptability, and you've got to build collaboratively. Everybody that's been on this stage and everyone in this room needs to work together to deliver a net zero Paris-proof building. You can't do it on your own. And the last thing to define is what is hybrid. I've talked about it a lot, but do we know what that is? Hybrid is basically a combination of materials to give you a product that delivers advantages over each individual material. And in hybrid high-rise, there's a few emerging technologies that are being used around the world. The first is mass timber concrete hybrids. So this is where you have a mass timber floor and a concrete topping on top. And they give you much longer floor spans than just a CLT floor or an LVL floor or mass timber floor. And they give you extra benefits with um, acoustics and vibration. The next version of hybrid is a timber frame and concrete hybrid. This is where you're using mass timber to create the frame and you're generally using concrete in the cores to provide stability. Generally here you need columns at closer centers, but you could combine this with the previous version to give you an additional hybrid option. And then there's timber floors and steel frame hybrids where you use a steel frame system, load bearing system, columns and beams, and then between those beams you put a timber floor. And again, this can be combined with the other two options to give you a whole heap of options that you can use when designing hybrid. But there's also emerging innovations in hybrid. There's uh, composite CLT and timber, uh, steel floor systems being investigated. The one at the top there is using grouted in connectors, but there's also demountable connectors being researched. And the other one there is a post-tension concrete slab. We're, we're using CLT infills where the floor is less heavily loaded. So all of these hybrid systems are coming onto the market. The benefit of hybrid is that you can get very low embodied carbon. So on the right here is a CLT and steel framed solution. But what this shows is it's not just about selecting the um, system. You've got to make the right choices. If you look in the middle, that's a concrete um, solution. And what you see is with the right choices, you can get a very low embodied carbon just through the concrete. If you make the wrong choices with the hybrid system, you're going to be doing worse than a concrete system. So it's about making the right choices. And when you're making the right choices, you need to look at in your structure where is the most carbon. 
what we found is 40% of that is in the floor, followed by walls and foundations. So some examples from around the world. This is C6 in Perth, 189 metre residential tower. It's got CLT floors and glue lamp beams and concrete cores and columns and a steel diagrid system. The diagrid is what you see in the elevation that's contributing to stability. Now they say that this is sustainable. It's got 463 kilograms of carbon per square metre. I'll leave you to decide if that's uh, sustainable. But it is much less than the concrete equivalent, which was up at 700 kilograms of carbon. But it does look nice inside. The next is the Atlassian headquarters in Sydney. This is an office building at 180 meters. This is a steel frame with a mass timber structure inside. The steel frame is that diamond shaped structure all around the outside with the exoskeleton. Within that, they've got four story high CLT mass timber units that slot in and provide different environments throughout the building. I couldn't find the embodied carbon calculation, but they say that this option is 50% less embodied carbon compared to a conventional building. I don't know what a conventional building is. You might have to act a conventional structure engineer. But again, looks great. What makes this really sustainable though is that those facades there, they're openable. And because this is in Sydney, in hot, nice weather, they can open those and in colder weather close it. And that's allowed them to um, have all of these spaces without any mechanical heating and cooling. The next is Brock Commons. This is 53 meters high. And this is a really good example of how hybrid can make uh, a net zero building. It's mass timber frames, CLT floors and glue lamp columns with concrete cores. And the embodied carbon is 236 kilograms. And this was designed and built in 2017. So years ago, this was on target to be Paris brief. And this is it being built. Burrard Exchange in Vancouver, another office building at 79 meters. This uses precast concrete columns with mass timber and the CLT floors with the concrete topping that we saw uh, with glue lamp timber beams. Again, they don't report the carbon in kilograms per square meter, but they do say it's 50% less than a conventional building again. It'd be good to see what the embodied carbon is, because I think this would come out quite good, mainly because of the height. And again, it looks great inside. Large columns and spacings to give you the flexibility on the floor plates. And then the last example is 55 South Bank in Melbourne. Now this is a 70 meter hotel with mass timber construction and steel stability cores. But the reason it's hybrid is it's only the top 10 stories that were new build. Those top 10 stories that are built in CLT were constructed on top of the existing reinforced concrete structure and reused the foundations. There's no embodied carbon for that, but if you consider they didn't have to build any foundations or any of the below ground structure, I'm pretty sure this would come out as Paris proof. And there it is. So when we look at the examples there and we talked about what does a, a building need to have to be net zero, all of those examples highlight that with hybrid you can build less, you can build light, you can build wise, you can build low carbon, you can build for the future, and you can build collaboratively. So is hybrid the answer? Well, hybrid construction has an important role in achieving net zero, but it won't be the answer all of the time. It should be an option every time. And one last thought, our high rise can outlast us so please make sure that your decisions you make when designing buildings allow you to say, I built that.
Thanks, uh, Thomas. Take a seat. Uh, Michiel, Jurian, and Matthijs can I ask you to, uh, to join us as well. Um, for a conversation uh, uh, with you as well. Uh, and we will uh, try to find a, def a definitive answer to the question whether there is such a thing as uh, carbon neutral or, excuse me, net zero uh, high rise. Um, I think your answers were no, right? And your answer is yes? My answer is yes. Okay. Um, the last uh, couple of buildings we saw were approximately 60, 65, 70, 79 meters tall. Does that have something to do with the fire regulations Michiel was talking about? Or does it have to do something with uh, the simple fact that if you go higher, you lose the potential to be net zero? Certainly, if you go higher, you lose the potential. What we find is if you go to about 15 to 30 stories, your embodied carbon starts to slowly increase, but above 30 stories, it suddenly skyrockets. Why does it increase and why does it skyrocket? Can you explain from a constructional perspective? It all comes down to the loading. At a certain point, there's a tipping point where you've got so much load for the materials that we've got today, you have to put in a lot more material. So the, the, the walls and the construction, the beams, uh, they have to be thicker. Every story you add on the ground floor, uh, everything gets thicker as well. Yeah, so it's, it's predominantly your columns and your foundations. Yeah. Yeah. So what's, what would be the ideal height um, from a climate perspective uh, of a building? So for a hybrid building, I think you're looking at something like 70 to 110 meters. Okay, agreed. Guys, uh, the ideal height, Michiel? He, kno he knows best, so I would say yes. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, yes, uh, but uh, again, it's it also very much on uh, local regulations, because the 70 meters about fire is only applicable in the Netherlands, so. But I think the range that uh, Thomas is addressing uh, might be right. Yeah, so the big question then is why would we build higher than that? That's a Do good you question. Ask a developer. <laughs> Well, th th that's also what you see, and that's why I I'm not sure if we're not going to build higher rise, or if we do. Uh, if we have all the regulations, then it becomes clear. But in the end, a lot of people want to develop higher rise, and, and, and you've seen the graph uh, you showed us, and it's okay. become it's I'm not an architect, I'm it's not a developer, I'm not an investor, I'm not in, but I'm just a curious uh, peasant. Um, wha wha what, why would you? Set aside uh, the whole discussion about climate neutrality or net zero, why would you build high rise in the first place? To what question is high rise the answer? Uh, I try to address it say in Rotterdam, uh, but uh, correct me if I go wrong. The city center was, if you compare it to the other big cities in the Netherlands, was lacking housing. Uh, after five o'clock, it was a, a dead area, it was mm -hmm. only retail. So the strategy to use high-rise in this kind of small urban fabric to, to add houses, I think, is a very logical And there was no Rotterdam. other way to densify than uh, if you using high-rise. If you choose the Paris model, you could say with the inner courtyards, you need bigger blocks. Mm -hmm. So you need a bigger distance between uh, your streets. I think that's... And, and that choice was already made in the uh, rebuilding the city. And that it so it's also a cultural thing. So we could have built another city after the war. Yeah. But the whole culture was being a modern city because we had a modern port, so we wanted to have a modern but cultural city. Cultural means we just like, uh, as Rotterdam-based architects, inhabitants, policy makers, we just like it. We just like the skyline, we just like, and that's why we do it. Well, in, in, in Rotterdam, it was also mentioned that you can add a tower, but your footprint should be double the size of the tower. Uh, so we also, in the end, we want the street life. Mm -hmm. But we also want more residents in the heart of our city, and their high rise can be an answer. It can't be. Uh, Yo, an it can okay, so this is the essence. I'm sorry to bother. I'm not, I hope I'm not. Vervelen, ik vind dat ik jullie verveel. Ja, dat ik annoy you. But th this is the essence for me for the hi about the high rise discussion. Uh, high rise can have a function. High rise can do this. High rise can help in densification. But is it? Is there a question? to which high-rise is the only solution. Uh, in Amsterdam, uh, we have um, the Sluisbuurt, and uh, there were two big discussions. 
the reason is less, but is let's say it's the a little bit on the outskirts of Amsterdam. So why should you build high rise? The first mm -hmm. thing was of course we have the regulation in Amsterdam Com looking from the city center, which is UNESCO heritage, you are not allowed to build higher if you can't see it. So it was some kind of strategic line and then it could be higher there. That was one reason. The second reason was there was actually there is no high rise or that much high rise in Amsterdam. And there were a lot of young people and men and, and women and etc. etc. who wants to live in a high rise. And the third reason was of course uh, did it bring more density? Well that answer I can give you very simple. Uh Shur Tsutas made a calculation. Mm -hmm. When you build all the blocks like Paris, or you build a high rise, the density was completely the same. So yeah. it was a political decision to make high rise. Yeah, because the people because they there was there was an idea that in Amsterdam, in if you tower. look in Amsterdam, there was a lot of let's say six, seven, eight, nine stories building blocks, etc. And then there was an idea: okay, we should add another type of typology to the city. So it can also be meaning that when you have a city and you want to have different types of living, different types of of living in a city that you can say, okay, we need some high rise. We need so that can also be a reason, but, but it has not strictly to do with high rise well, and, so and density. But I think one of the biggest reasons were the the, the ground economics, uh, the, the 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 plots, uh, the high ground prices, and that somebody has a plot and wants something to do with it, and it's uh, yeah more difficult to look at on a, on a bigger scale. So I think also we are talking a lot about only building, so you're in a bit about the, the bigger scale, I think we should, we should not only talk about high-rise building, but uh, environments. Huh? So what is a good environment in an existing city? Indeed, it's difficult to uh, get rid of all the blocks and make, make Paris. Mm -hmm. So there's sometimes also uh, is a good reason to make a uh, bit more higher buildings. Uh, but I think that's the, the economic part is a very uh, strong driver, I think, for making uh, high rise. Not that it's always good, but... Uh, but in the end, it's not really b economic, not for, for, for the municipality. The no, 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 for the owner, the owner the yeah, owner yeah, wants yeah, exactly. to maximize. Uh, New York is only about uh, bonus malus rules. Mm. Oh, so it's not for the municipality or for the people uh, inhabiting a city, it's just for the investor or the developer. It's, it's attractive to do because the mm. penthouses get uh, sold well for bigger prices. Th that okay. depends. Yeah, for okay. so uh, for I, I would ask the developer to Zandtoren on which party earned the most money. The two small ones or the, the big one? And, and the answer uh, to the uh, question uh, is? The two small ones. Okay. Yeah, so and again, and no high, high rise, high rise, and of course I can't look into the bookkeeping of my, my client for the cool tower and the contractor, but it's not a highly profitable model. It's the margins are really thin. And also for the for the, the ground so price. So it's bad so for the climate. So it's I, I, not, I it's think not it's no not a good business model. It's just yeah, but there's a different thing to functionality because yes, you can add a lot of apartments or offices at a small plot, which of course can also be used to activate a certain area of the city, and, and therefore it has a functional uh, meaning. But also you can call it identity, but it accelerates a certain urban development of an area. Because it becomes meaningful to people. If they don't all uh, uh, take the elevator to your parking garage, step and get into their car and drive to uh, to Amsterdam to work. No, but... It okay. but <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll stop teasing Th that's you. That's not allowed in Rotterdam. We have regulations that no. you can't go from your apartment directly to your uh, parking garage. Okay. Okay. Especially okay. not to Amsterdam. Um, <laughs> exactly. and especially no, no, that's, uh, that's not allowed. Any, any, any questions uh, from, from you guys? I'll try to find you. So uh, what I found really interesting is there is this through line through maybe all four of you where, and I tried to finish my study archeology span and I didn't manage to, but still there's this notion of keeping a building uh, uh, essential to the city. That's what I heard, like uh, it being relevant. And then also it being able to, to like kind of stay relevant for, I heard like 400 years or something along those lines. But then also there's this idea of like replace replaceability. So at least at a horizontal level, I hear like being able to break through all the walls and like rearrange an apartment. And then also vertically, because you talked about like this, uh, this concrete like under structure and then you build a thing on top. My question is, so all these things are happening, but how realistic is it that there's not just another group of 
architects and developers 200 years from now who are gonna destroy those buildings because at that point everything is already better so how do you kind of or how do you do this thing where it's the opposite of planned obsolescence because i feel like if there's only this many spaces where you can make high rises and those are limited we saw the, the maps eventually all the high rises are going to be built just all of them and then what happens after that yeah so yeah it's, i mean it's a good question the it's similar to you could say i'm not going to give up smoking because next in a few years time there'll be a healthy cigarette your best option is to give up smoking now. So our best option for high rise is to make them more attractive for adaptation and extension by designing now. We can only influence the generations in front of us by leading by example. So that's why we want to design for circularity, demountability, make sure that systems that have s shorter service lives can be replaced. In terms of um, if you use all of the places to build high rise, what next? There's always building over railway tracks and things like that. There's always the next engineering challenge to do. There will always be someone who can come along and make a new business model for building somewhere that hasn't previously been built on. So I think you if you a question. So then it will always go higher. That's the because then there's uh, always an incentive to go higher. Yeah, as, as, as long as there's people wanting to live in a city, I think you will always build high rise. I think the thing driving going higher is a bit of ego and a bit of developers wanting to be the highest. And there, there's nothing you can do about that. You saw the Steinway uh, Tower in New York. That's 46 apartments at 435 meters. It's nonsense. It's not delivering anything to that city other than giving people the prestige. But people buy it. If I may we can't change that. If I may add to that, I think it's, it's a very relevant thing because there are two things. We as designers, we need much more strict rules or let's say carbon ceilings or whatever. So it needs to be a very tough level playing field for all of us because that's the only way we can challenge the industry. The industry also wants to innovate, but if the rules change every week, they, they, they can't make any commitments. Uh, the second thing is it's not about making higher buildings, but smarter buildings. Actually, we, we construct in a very old fashioned way. Uh, we integrate all the piping etc in the concrete because then we have uh, we can squeeze in another floor in the height of a tower if you're a little smart you add 30 centimeters to your floor to floor height so all you can make let's say all your installations underneath the structural floor slab the structure will stand for 400 years i may hope uh, uh, but your installations will be, will be removed or changed or replaced after 50 years so we have to design much more along life cycles of elements rather than making one tower and think uh, it will stay forever or for 100 years. So smarter and then replace elements when we have new technology and better performing uh, um, facade elements I'm going or to energy elements. I'm going to speed things up a little bit because we have 15 minutes left and we have some, a number of questions we have and here's Saskia van Stein from IABR. Thank you, yes. Thank you for the uh, lovely introductions. My question is a little bit around education um, because, Jurian, you said we can't do it yet um, because we need innovation. I hear Michiel saying, I'm learning a lot from my colleagues here. My question is literally, where would you we situate the types of knowledge we need to speed all of this up? Is the leverage in governance? Is it in the market? Is it in technology? Or, or back to the profession on how we educate uh, architects? Or is it the grand old, um, there's too much capital looking for gravity? Sorry, it's a lot of questions in one, but I, I'm genuinely intrigued by this. Where is the leverage for speeding this up? I think on, on all scales you have to speed up. What we see is sharing your knowledge if you have developed a building and it's calculated. People think that's risky. Uh, or they, 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 are, they are afraid. So that is something that you have to, to change, that you can, uh, uh, um, you, you can share all that. Also the regulations, we want to go to a honest way of calculating in Rotterdam, but then most of investors and developers and architects also work in different cities, and the industry works in different cities, so then you need the national government. So I think you need all of it to, to, to make it work. Here in Rotterdam, we just say, 
we're going to start, we're going to have a, a, uh, an honest calculation, and hopefully we can convince people as we want to work together that everyone shares. But uh, you need everyone. Matthijs, there's a, there's a duurzaam doorbouwen something in the making, right? Is it a nota, a yep. report? Yeah. What, 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 what is it? And what does it entail? Can you say something about it? Um, yeah, I can. We already have the uh, uh, Doorbau Accord uh, in, in Rotterdam with all the parties uh, uh, that are developing and, and building in our city. That we're not going to uh, stop building uh, in this crisis. We've done that in 2008 and then everyone got unemployed and we lost a lot of knowledge. Um, now, with a big group of people, architects, developers uh, and so on, we have said to one another, it has to be sustainable. It, we have to go to Paris proof. And how can we do that? So we're making the plans there and the agreements. And um, I think in, 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 in about a month's time, we, we, we can tell more about that. Uh, but that's what we are working now on uh, at the moment. Okay. Maybe can I Julian? answer your yeah? question? I think my story is also about the new normal. I think with the G4, and now also I know there's the signature on the G40, that the new normal is the way of, let's say, the language of it, then we compare on a certain level on the same way, but always uh, uh, the, the comparison between uh, knowledge is better, that we should share. But the other issue is, of course, that we need, that's also in this booklet, we need better data. I mean, we're missing really the real information. I mean, you were saying about the concrete. Well, I know in, the en in all the buildings, you get this calculation of your building, eh? you have an expert and make the calculation. They are 25% wrong. My statement, and they are maybe they are 30% wrong. They are higher, much higher. They use the wrong type of, en of concrete. They always use the concrete that is not in your building. They use the steel that is not in your building. So we should have the knowledge all together. What is the concrete? What are we calculating? How are we calculating? How are we measuring it? And then with sharing this information, I mean, we are not doing less, eh? we are not doing better. Eh? I'm never saying, and we all these bu buildings we built are terrible looking at CO2. So that I can sell you. But I only want to show you how bad it is. So I went also to BPD, the developer, and I showed them that all the buildings we made, there was a calculation, 25% higher was the outcome when we put in the real concrete, only the real concrete that was in the building. Nobody knows, they say, yeah, it's complicated. Well, it's not complicated. The amount of materials, by the amount of CO2 in it, the amount of materials in the building, it's a simple one, A, B, C, everybody can calculate, everyone can count, but we are not uh, prepared to share really that it's going not the right direction. So we are fooling each other. So the knowledge is there, but we should be open to share that it's not going the right way. Do we have to stop building? No, I'm not saying we have to stop building, but we do it smarter, like you were saying, or see how can we do it, that like you were showing. So hybrid building, and it's not bad, but it's better, like you showed. Yeah, but that's so what you've described there is a very Dutch problem, because in other countries they are sharing the data. And for example, England and is now saying, we're not going to meet our targets. No, no, but that's the problem for us, for example, and, and for NMB, so I know about that we, we have a lot of, <coughs> we have a lot of uh, systems from the abroad, abroad eh? Uh, we know them all, Revalu, well, you know them all, eh, from yeah. Henning Larsen, you have, wi so we use all these international standards, yeah. but the only one who is different from you and all the international European standards are we. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that, uh, we like to fool ourselves, and we are always a little bit different. We are special. We are Dutch. <laughs> so we stop being Dutch, but should be uh, being Europeans. We have a question over here. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentations. Um, my question was to Matthias about whether these uh, facts or figures are checked internally in the municipality. When a developer comes to you, do you look at uh, the claims from external consultants or overheating assessments, these kinds of things? Do you go through that? information and, and double check that. <laughs> no, no, I, I can't, no. Um, we have said to one another within the municipality, we have to check the numbers better, that what uh, they have said 
Bootley in the building is, is also what they are building. But main, li like um, a handhaving, what's uh, in it? Sorry, so you, so you have said to each other, we should do this better, so and this uh, means yeah. he is not checking it sufficiently so at, the, at no, the moment. The so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. You almost exactly. sound like a politician, Matthijs, uh, uh, but yeah, he's, not sorry, he's doing uh, his job very poorly. That's actually what he said. No, yeah. but <laughs> the, the like uh, handhaving, the, the, the enforcement of that something we are really bad at in Rotterdam, but also in the Netherlands. So we don't check. We have said now we're gonna check. So there's two guys who are non-stop checking all these calculations now. And we need, I think, if we want to do that, we need a lot more. And they also have to go outside. So checking, seeing if the data is I'm right. I'm sorry, Matthijs, I'm a little bit uh, uh, amazed by this, that you're only starting to do this just just now w w is, isn't that a little strange no, i'm not sorry I'm I, not I, I, he, I, is, he is finally he is honest so, so <laughs> no, no but that's, that's i mean that's what don't ask that this is the honesty we also found out in amsterdam i think we have they have i know the guy who did it in rotterdam he says i have four hours a week for checking everything that's built in rotterdam four mm -hmm. hours a week finally they have put the idea we need something more but I was also with a lot of developers and they have a big problem. They want to have an as-built model from the client, from the builder, the as-built model, before they have to do this, uh, uh, let's say, these checks for Europe, for the COT checks as companies. So it will be more pushed from the clients who said, we really need the right building data, but not when the permission is asked, but we need the model after it is built. So what is really put into the building? But even after this permission, the builders change. <laughs> okay, okay. But it, but it's it's and it's not only Rotterdam. It's everywhere. We had the diesel gate. It wasn't checked properly. Yeah. And I can on and on have with with all the uh, the pesticides. It's the same thing. It is safe, and then a lot of people get ill. Why didn't you check? That's also something that is going on in 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 every industry, and also within the municipality we all know we have to cut budget where do you cut your budget first in these sort of things so that's 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 uh, rotterdam is not typical in that no but it okay. is a poor thing yeah thank you there were a lot of questions over yeah thank you okay um thomas from uh, superworld i have one uh, one question it feels a bit that now we are in this vacuum or this weird transition phase where like 1.5, are we gonna make that? Is it more like two? We're still like in this area of doubt that also leaves us somehow to be inconsequent still. I've read uh, the other day that in Austria, where, where I'm from, we passed 1.5 officially. It's heating up faster than the north. We're, we, we passed the line. And I'm wondering uh, at what, where's the line where we're gonna shut it all down? Like where is the line where uh, we, ca we just say, we cannot go with the maybes anymore like it's over it's uh, do do you do you need a line i would expect that you, you already know we already know we just don't look up we don't look left we, we don't look nowhere we just go your on. experience a little bit too too much maybes in the discussion tonight but um but for for the discussion do you need somebody to tell you when to stop i think it's our all we have our obligation to do what we can do max so i don't need 1.5 or 1.7 I just need to decide for myself, uh, maybe a question, do I want to continue as architect to do new buildings? Or am I only going to work on existing buildings? We have to be much more radical in our approach. Would you, would you do the, the, the cool tower again if somebody approached you and said, and, and gave you, you know, not rebuild the same, same building, but do, would you do something like that again uh, in 2024? I would still do high rise, but only in a way that I can prove that um, the things which are, let's say, are costing, costing carbon or costing money or costing space, are there to last forever, and that the things from which we think they are good technology now can be replaced for new technology in the future. So you're saying you do it with WSP? Sorry? You're saying you do it with WSP then? We can help yeah, you. That's with your that. personal <laughs> view. That's all right. Yeah. No, I but I, I, I want to answer your question. Why do you think I made this calculation? I already think for two or three years, maybe we can, for example, not build 900,000 houses in the Netherlands, and we don't need them. We don't need 900,000. I mean, we don't need. Uh, we 
our office is 99% housing, eh? 40 people working in the office. The message is we don't need housing. Can you understand the difficulty we are in the office? But that's the discussion. We don't need 300 or a million houses. And you can also see, we calculated, we cannot even build them if we have the budget. So we have to make a radical decision. And the radical decision is maybe to, to split up the, the houses we have already. We have 4 million uh, houses in the Netherlands with our family housing. 55%, 60% Utrecht, 50% uh, Rotterdam is single housing. Can we split the houses? So we need new regulations. So the focus on architecture, on schooling and training on schools is not designing beautiful new buildings. Yes, of course, but designing beautiful new cities that are existing and change them. So that's a difficult discussion, but it's also what we are discussing in the office. And of course, we are building a wood and we are keep on building, but this is the balance. This is the, yeah. I mean, I'm an old guy, so I stop in three years and I leave you with the problem, but that's not the solution, I guess. Uh, some maybe, uh, some maybe for the sake of discussion, yeah. uh, I think we have to be much more radical. Uh, if we know that we have two types of cement, one is good and one is bad, just put a ban on the bad one and say to the industry, just solve it. We're not building anything anyway this moment, so they have time to solve it. So be much more uh, critical, be much more uh, challenging for the industry. We, we know what is good, but we're still allowed to, to uh, the bad things to be used. Uh, the example you showed, uh, Black 333. So there's an existing structure in concrete, demolished, and new structure built. Of course, it looks good and uh, it's all, all nice, but maybe you should put a penalty on destroying something out of concrete, which could stay there and has already, already a lot of embodied uh, carbon in it. There's also a really interesting uh, high-rise project on uh, uh, Hofplein, uh, 250 meters tall, right? Is it supposed to? Be? There's a there's a big building that's uh, that, that has to be demolished. Will will that uh, uh, be stopped, Matthijs? If uh, we think about the discussion tonight, will we will we will we receive buildings like this in the city of Rotterdam? Knowing what we uh, should it be stopped? Uh, perhaps that's. Uh, I, I don't think it will be stopped. Um, but th that's also the case. A lot of the high-rise projects, well, not the rise project, but a lot of them have have a history of ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, so the decision was made in a time where there were no problems. Well, there were problems, but. Uh, um so, so, so that is also the difficulty with the knowledge. Now, I was at a building, uh, uh, standing on the roof of a building. Can uh, you answer the question, should it be stopped? If we all think that uh, sticking to the, uh, to the budget, if then you should stop it. Uh, should stop it. Then it's a nonsensical, a nonsensical thing to do in the words but of But Thomas. then there's a lot of other factors that also uh, play a role in the whole development. Uh, there's uh, one of the towers is social housing. The housing corporation thinks it's really good housing. They want new social housing for their uh, target group, for their clients. So um, there is lots of things involved. Okay. And, okay. and you can't well just Let's stop continue it. this discussion at, at, uh, at the bar uh, during yeah. drinks. Are there any questions for now that you, you guys really want to address? Uh, uh with all of us present. Who has the, let me rephrase, who has the, the one or two very important, most important questions maybe of, the of tonight? Or are you all satisfied? Is it, is it, is it, it's a small, is it really important? Or is it a small? <laughs> it has to be really, no. <laughs> small. Now, at, uh, I agree that we should be more uh, uh, radical, uh, either with uh, looking at existing or uh, to low-carbon uh, things. But my question, Joran, is, is there already the tools we need to make decisions on keeping neighborhoods, transforming, uh, slope, new bow, with all, all the other ambitions we want in, in and to also convince clients and politics, because it I think it's mostly that, are there already the tools to make these more integral decisions on neighborhoods, if it's low-rise, high-rise, etc. Or do we need more I will uh, give the experience answer. on that? Um, you s we have this carbon cost tracker. We are now busy with making it, um, let's say, web-based. 
And I hope after the summer, it's a testing tool. So what we made it, it was for the municipalities that when there's a coming a plan, you put it over the plan and you build the building. You're so you're just testing the building. Okay, is it probably possible what they make? So the idea behind the, the tool was, so we're going to make it best web-based and it's going to be public, uh, free use. And the problem is the NMD, they were not, they, do, they don't allow us to share the CO2 data. <laughs> so that's my problem. So that's the discussion I have with, uh, with the ministry at the moment. So we will make it web-based and I hope everybody will support that we just push them that we have to have a tool that we can test and everybody can freely test buildings ahead and then make a design. I mean, it's not like we design with the building, but we should test it. So it's a testing building, it's a testing tool. So yes, it's going to be web-based, and yes, I hope we're going to get support to have it for different types of buildings and quicker. And we're going to have a testing tool with the municipality also on uh, urban space. Uh, so the, the, the streets and underground with Naturalis, we're working on that. And then we have a tool, I hope, with a lot of people there. Eh? We also with Carbon Lab who are thinking. So there are a lot of people supporting that we together make tools that we quicker get the solutions. And also schools can use it and students and so on. So that's the idea behind everything. I want to thank you all for being here, thinking with us, discussing with us. Uh, I want to thank you. We're going for drinks at the bar. Please check out the exhibition. It's awesome. If you haven't checked it, uh, please do. Uh, hopefully see you at the next Carbon Stories event, which is on the 20th of June, then the 12th of September, and then the 21st of November of 2024. Thank you for being here. And thanks again for Jurian van Stich, Michiel Rapport, Matthijs van Rijven, Thomas Musson. My name is Geert Maas. Tot de volgende keer.